I'm just going to, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, with this is, we actually uh, haven't done this together before. So we've got a sort of an idea of who's doing which part. Uh, so just bear with us. We do actually work together in the same office. So we do talk. <laughs> Sometimes. But sometimes. Um, but anyway, so um, I'm Paul Sutherland, um, Christ City Libraries. I've worked there for a long time. And uh, my role is uh, the rather elegantly um, digital content innovation librarian, which sounds as exciting as my life really is. Um, and then Sarah's going to introduce herself, and then I'll come back soon. Yeah. Kira Koto, Katoa, Ko Sarah Snelling Toko Ingoa. I'm the Digital Curation Librarian with the Christchurch City Libraries. My position was a newly created position when I started about two years ago and since January of this year I have been focusing on the project that we'll be talking about today which is the Discovery Wall. So the Discovery Wall is an immersive and interactive digital cityscape created mainly from images from the Christchurch City Libraries collection. It is presented on a seven metre long multi-touch screen at Tūranga, which is the recently opened library in Christchurch's central city. The aims of the project were to showcase some of the more hidden aspects of our collection to the public, which was basically our digital heritage collection. To connect people to the memories and stories, to build the collection by enabling the public to contribute their own images and stories, and also so they can realise that their own stories are actually important to contribute, and to provide even more wow factor to the city, to the one of the city's anchor rebuild projects. So this is taken on opening day, so it was a very busy day and it's the first time that a lot of the public have seen it. In addition to the seven metre wall in Tūranga, there is also a mobile discovery wall. This is me playing on it in our office. Um, so we'll be using the mobile wall for outreach events here it is on its first outing to the Positive Ageing Expo, which was actually before the opening of the opening of Turinga. And it will also be, uh, here it is at the Heritage Day, which was actually on the same weekend as Turinga opening. Um, so as well as the outreach events, it will be touring around our network libraries. So the, um, the user experience won't just be in the central city, it will also be around Christchurch. So this is a 75 inch screen and it has the same content and operates in the same way as the Discovery Wall in Tūranga. Website. You. Yeah, so we didn't practice, so. Um, anyway, uh, so and the third part of the deal is that there is a website which is at discoverywall.nz. If you've got a phone and you feel distracted, you can look at that now and not pay attention. Um, and that has got all the content that's on the Discovery Wall. This also acts as the um, vehicle for public engagement by adding content to um, the collection. So um, that, for those of you who are inclined, is a picture of how it all joins together that was drawn up by um, the council, our council's IT department. Um, so I just love pictures like that, especially see the little people. <laughs> Sarah and me are down the bottom somewhere. Um, and you're up there on the cloud on the right, top right. So how do we get there uh, and, and why did we get there? Uh, it's kind of interesting to reflect on. As some of you might be aware, the Canterbury earthquake sequence happened in 2010-2011. This is a, a slide from GNS uh, about a month after 22nd of February showing the intensity of some of those earthquake sequences. They didn't stop when the slide was made, but it's the best one I could find. Um, so there was a bit of disruption to the city. Um, and uh, rather prosaically, this is out of one of Sarah's um, document, which was the recovery agency built uh, to rebuild the city. Um, 
and you know it, the city will never be like it was, um, which is good and bad. The Warren Marnie designed um, building, the uh, 1982 building, uh, Canterbury Public Library building, a great piece of brutalist architecture. I loved it. I worked in that building on every floor, been in every floor in the basement, on the roof, places that you don't even know exist. Fared quite well. Um, but unfortunately, the uh, recovery plan thought that it should go uh, and it didn't, it didn't deserve the amount of work that would make it work again and we needed to move um, into a new city, a city made up of little blobs. So the library, but the new central library became a part of the recovery and um, for those of you who are interested, a lot of it was crown driven, a lot, some of it is crown and council driven and the library was an entirely council driven um, project. So they moved it and they put us in the square, which is a good place to be, beside a broken cathedral. Um, so there was a desire to, we, we said goodbye to the old building. Why, this is just before the building was demolished. It's quite, a, quite an emotional thing to say goodbye to, yeah, quite an emotional thing. Um, but while we were saying goodbye to the building and keeping library services, we had two um, temporary libraries and we had a whole library service. We had buildings to fix all across the city along with the rest of the city. Boffins were coming up with architectural visions. So we engaged some, um, some people, a uh, Danish architecture firm to sort of come up with a vision for a wow factor building. That's it just before um, it was handed over to the council. With that wow building, and it really is a wow building if you've been there, and if you haven't been there, go there, because it is a wow building. That's a library as well. Um, uh, but it's a great civic space, but they wanted some other wow factors in it, other than they already had. So um, interestingly, in one of the very first uh, council um, documents, there was this thing uh, in there about um, that the city probably needed an earthquake, earthquake um, museum and maybe an interactive multimedia representation of the city's memory. This to me looks like Gibson were in the game really early on. So uh, somehow a lot of bit and pieces of negotiating and manoeuvring and it was decided that it was going to happen. And bang, did it happen to the, the community. Uh, $1.24 million, uh, the ombudsman got involved, Gibson wouldn't release the costs, all these sort of things we got told off. But in actual fact, it was just a small component of the building's total build, um, and the taxpayers' union should be paying attention to other things. So what's in it? Um, we said when we first engaged with Gibson, while well, we're having this, this is going to happen, this is not going to happen, sort of thing along. Um, uh, we said, yeah, we've got heaps of stuff, it's all ready to go, we'll just be able to throw it in. <laughs> we've been collecting, uh, like we're a collecting organisation, we're a library, um, and we've been digitising material for 20 years. Um, uh, all sorts of material from our uh, archives, publications, um, postcards, we photographed a lot of things in the, uh, you know, 30 years ago and had them laminated on cardboard and then later on we, photo we turned those into digital things. Um, and um, uh, quite a diverse collection. Then we started, uh, we put some money into actually going out and digitising, actually digitising material, um, we, we, you know, using a, a professional vendor. Um, and um, reaching out to the community and getting collections, this collection of Korean War photos um, were lent to us, we digitised them and the, the creator of those photographs, Norman Pearson, still has them. So we moved into new territory of actually crowdsourcing our imagery. Um, this is another collection from a, a little photographer who owns, still owns the um, physical, both the negatives and the photographs. Um, and more recently, we've been engaged with the University of Canterbury. This is our fourth year where we've actually uh, had students working as interns or working for their paper, going out to the community and photographing um, the community and actually creating a documentary record of our community um, as it is now from a, a you know a documentary professional, kind of interesting 
that's a funny supermarket. I just don't, I don't like that supermarket. <laughs> just by the way. Um, we've been heavily involved with the Kede uh, community. Um, we've currently got about 40,000 images on Kede. We um, had an initial project where we weren't sure whether we wanted to engage with Kede because we thought, well, maybe we would, maybe we wouldn't. Um, but we got stuff in. Then around about the, well, the earthquakes happened and then we started getting earthquake photos. Um, and we've still got, I've got about, I don't know, somewhere between 60 and 100,000 earthquake photos still to deal with. Um, I say that, I, I don't know the number because there's lots of duplicates because um, they were from the council and there's a lot of file renaming. If you've got one file, why don't you rename it five different ways? We started in 2008 with a, uh, a project for, um, uh, we call it Photo Hunt, but it's a crowdsourcing project to get in, the, in one month to get the community to bring in photographs. We scan them and give them back to them and we were adding them. Initially we added them to Flickr um, and then we added them to Kete. And this year, um, 247, there's a diverse range of photographs from the community um, went up on the Discovery Wall website. Various themes were um, becoming evident in our crowdsource material. Um, these are dairies. These are butchers. That butcher shop there is now a plant-based plant -based breakfast bar. That butcher shop there, the one on the left, the Addington print, is now a plant-based cafe. <laughs> When the word of the Discovery Ball came out, people started saying this, oh yeah, I've got some photos, I've got some things, can, can, can you use them? So this is someone who went around and took photographs of civic buildings, um, some of which, half of those are there, half of them aren't anymore. And just took, you know, ordinary people's photographs. We had someone um, who contributed photos, she lived in Christchurch, her husband was a lecturer at UC, and she lived there off and on um, between the uh, 60s and 2008, so she contributed us a number of so we had all these things kind of coming to us and then this really fantastic thing happened well it's sad and great the Christchurch Star newspaper had a room with hundreds this is about a quarter of the filing cabinets of their photo collection that had been pulled out of a liquefaction filled room and didn't have any catalogue to go with it it did have um, some folders and envelopes and things. So it consisted of, of um, both copy prints and negatives. And negatives, yeah. So um, we received this around about the same time as we received the word that the wall is going ahead. And it, it was quite exciting because it filled in a gap. So we had some we were community source photographs, but these were photographs taken for a newspaper um, uh, of civic events, and um, the Crunchy Star was a uh, less a paper of record and more a paper of the people. So there were lots of um, people, activity, sports, um, and and things. Uh, this woman's. So we started digitising those in house. Um, and um, Sarah selecting them for the wall. We've also got these um, ranges of negatives which have um, things like, uh, that's labelled protest. And that's two sides of the same protest. That's the strikers and that's the people trying to negotiate the strike deal through. So we're getting these professionally digitised and that's going to provide a very interesting challenge of how we deal with them. Um, because they're negatives joined together and they're different pictures. Right. So the Gibson Group are a Wellington based company that we worked with to create the Discovery Wall. They've built three other cityscapes around the world and this is the first in New Zealand. Um, a thousand hero images were required for sufficient population of the Discovery Wall of buildings, streets, landscapes, people and events to enable a three-dimensional collage to be created that users can explore. This creates a visual psychogeographic representation of stories about Christchurch for the citizens of and visitors to Christchurch rather than providing a Google-type map. 
The nature and scale of the Discovery Wall provided us with the ambitious task to represent some aspects of all of geographic Christchurch, including Banks Peninsula, cover a large time scale, so roughly from the 1860s to the present day, and include a multitude of topics so that everyone can find something in the Discovery Wall to relate to. All visitors to the Discovery Wall will hopefully connect with, some, with an image that relates to a story about them, whether that comes from the area that they grew up in, or live in now, activities that they participate in, events that they know about, family stories or trips, or even what they passed on their way to touring that day. So I came up with 12 broad topics, people, kaitahu and Māori content, uh, recreation, public spaces, environment, built environment, services, events, business, transport, animals and societal changes, and then worked with my team to try and flesh out some of these ideas and come up with exactly some lists of things to try and find in our whole collection. Um, I use these listings as a guide rather than as a prescriptive list to find everything. Uh, so curating the content for the wall depending on what I could find in the collection rather than finding exactly everything that we listed out. So that's just one of the nodes that we sort of mind mapped out. And that's just sort of coming up with some examples in the central city of specific things that everyone thought was important to include in the wall. Uh, so to create the foundation for the discovery wall to be built, we needed to create a framework based on circle, which is how the interactive experience is designed. We grouped the areas of Christchurch into about 80 communities or bubbles and then mapped them onto a circle so that they were roughly in the correct relationship to each other. Each community was then given a code. This was our first um, freehand drawing, just sort of from memory and how it could actually work. And then that's the one that Gibson came back with, and much more professional and much more <laughs> exact. Uh, there was a bit of back and forth to try and really nut out where things should actually go. So this then allows images that, uh, this is a um, more of a central city and the codes that I used, so I had all of these codes in my head and knew exactly what they were and yeah, <laughs> so living by codes. Hmm? We're at 20 minutes now. Hmm? Um, so this is one of the hero images. Um, so I worked with our Maori services team to select appropriate images to be included in the discovery wall and this is an ongoing process. And we've also included in the CMS structure the ability to add te in the future when we've got more capacity to be able to do that. This is some of the drafting up of cutting out the images and placing it on the bubble structure. And so some of these um, hero images were also animated, so like the plane in the sky that goes around in the whole city as well. And this was the Mac Mini that we had in our office to just actually see the design come to life because before we got that I was just printing out little images and sticking them on pieces of paper because <laughs> I was actually managing the whole selection through a um, spreadsheet because as Paul was talking about, well our collections are sort of digitised in different places so to get them in one place where I could visually see them, it was in a spreadsheet. And this was when we first got the, the mobile wall. Um, so each hero image also has a album behind it. So in each album we roughly aim to have about five images for when we meet live. So that was a thousand hero images and then another four or five thousand album images for when we meet live. So that's five thousand images that we needed to source from January to, well, May for the hero images and then when we opened for the rest, so October. That's some of the search widgets. And then some of the user engagement is that people at the wall can compose a postcard and send it to themselves. They can also comment on images and they can upload their own images as well. And this all goes through a moderation process. So we were suffering from serious technical debt, and we still are, um, and that we needed to supply images to um, Gibson and spreadsheets, or we could type them in form by form, by field by field. But um, uh, we managed to have a process where we can upload things. But our current website our, of, our, of 
digital images, our archives and books, etc. It's all generated using um, a bit of uh, code, Access 97 joined with a product thumbnail of version 6.4, which is no longer even exists, an ODBC connector running on Windows XP, running in a virtual machine. So it's, it was pretty good once. So, um, <laughs> but one, uh, it, you know, it manages to uh, produce pages, and this is the latest uh, um, page that we've done for the Central City Students Project. We had problems with um, getting all this extra stuff, uh, almost weekly alerts, with part of the archiving the STAR project, the stuff that we're sending to NZMS, receive, we're receiving about 100 gigabytes um, per month, on top of the in-house scanning and the material we've already got, and other program digitisation. So I think that's solved now. So uh, before we actually had engaged the wall, we thought that we were going to, we did, we went out to market for a digital heritage repository. And um, this time last year, we had actually chosen a vendor. But through various internal processes that um, organisations go through and politics and things, it stalled for a very long time. And we've just actually signed a contract this week to come up with a thing. So. What we did discover while we were creating things for the discovery wall is that our, some of our description of our material wasn't actually that great. And we'd done things like um, told stories on pictures, told stories with images that really didn't relate to the image. This one particularly interesting about Mandy Rice visiting Christchurch in 1962. So we had put our images on Flickr uh, for our photo hunt and we moved them to Kete. Um, using some sort of magic because we're not script wizards. We're just, you know, I know a little bit of something, but we managed to suck it out of Flickr, our, our Flickr collection, um, and mash the data. But then we found when we started to use the stuff that was in Kede, we hadn't paid very much attention to file naming. And spaces matter. We managed to get the data out of Kete. I've downloaded every single page, our 40,000 pages of Kete, two forms, HTML and XML, and sucked that data out. Um, quite good data and created um, a lot of key value pairs to reconstruct that data. So we can import it into the Gibson Wall framework. Yep, I'm just gonna carry on, you can leave the room. We, we, we won't be long. Um, We've had problems with macrons because our, although Excel, our tool of choice because everyone knows Microsoft, um, can handle uh, Unicode, when it's exported to CSVs, it can't. So we managed to find a solution there, so I'm now using this export from um, uh, Excel to CSV to retain the macrons. Um, but it also causes another thing if we want to update our data when we export it back into Excel, we lose the macrons. And of course, Excel being our friend, wants to turn all the dates into Excel date format. Um, so I use Libra, Libra to um, import and create a XLS file. Um, we also discovered that we haven't been very good with copyright and understanding it. So we're grappling with that at the moment. So uh, we've got the ability to say things that are in copyright or out of copyright or unsure. <laughs> um, and we have got a lot of material. The, the Christchurch Star material is in copyright. And we, we're okay with that. Creative Commons, you know, it's possibly overrated. And maybe this is what we should be really looking at moving forward, uh, uh, right statements um, for the cultural sector rather than the cultural you know, the Creative Commons, maybe we need to move on. Um, this is just a little few images of the construction of the wall and the opening day. There's a few analytics of how people physically engage with the wall. So uh, it was kind of a bit of that, so. That's pretty much, just skip out those last things. But this is just uh, quite an interesting thing because this was in our very first uh, contributed photo in our very first photo hunt. 10 years after the photo was taken, 
uploaded to initially Flickr and then moved to Keta and now it's on the discovery wall and there's the person standing in front of the discovery wall with his hero image. So. <laughs>